I'm first up. What I'll talk about today is to um, provide a context, um, provide context around the um, sensitive data guide and what the goals of the guide were. So I'll introduce its content and the key points that might pique your interest, because obviously I won't have time to run through the detail of everything that's in the guide, and also then talk about, well, where to from here? Having put this guide um, up on the web and, and having had some interesting response from it already, what are we going to do um, from now on? How are we going to add to that? Um, and then, I, as I said, some time for discussion and any new ideas that you as the community um, have following the presentation today. So what is the Guide to Publishing and Sharing Sensitive Data? We released the guide on the 23rd of September, so just a couple of weeks ago, alongside um, one of our ANZ UP newsletters. If you want to look at that newsletter, because it's got a good summary of the guide as well and some other bits in it, there's the, uh, the link there. The guide's written for, well, anyone who's managing sensitive data. So it includes data managers, researchers, members of the research office, data librarians, anybody really. It is introductory level information, however, the guidance through the steps and the decisions made within the guide in terms of directing you as to what to do and, and what sequence to do things in are relevant to everybody regardless of um, your level of understanding and expertise. Why did we create the guide in the first place? Well, as you know, as most of you are probably here because you do use or deal with sensitive data, is that it can be a little bit trickier than other forms of data. It involves extra steps to publication and sharing that need consideration, uh, namely things around the legal and ethical side of things. At the moment, unfortunately, there was a little publicly available in terms of guidance to help navigate the process and to guide decisions about publishing uh, sensitive data. What we found that was out there was quite disparate um, in terms of the level that it was aimed at, um, the level of detail, uh, and its inclusiveness as well. And by that, I mean that often parts of the steps involved in publishing sensitive data might have been included or, or spoken about, but not the full sort of go to woe, which is what we're, we've tried to do in the guide. Consistently, there was an express need amongst the data community for navigation and some consensus around publishing sensitive data, which isn't to say that there's ever going to be a one size fits all for, for sensitive data, but some consensus in the process of how this is done, what steps everybody needs to consider to start from here's my data to here's me and my published data. And probably most importantly is that all of these, these points above have prevented researchers and data managers from reaping the potential benefits of publishing their sensitive data. So those are benefits for you as the researcher or the data manager in terms of the data becoming discoverable, which can lead to citations, collaborations, reputation and profile, which can lead to future funding, uh, tracking the reach and output and reuse of your data, ability to publish in leading journals. So a number of leading journals, PLOS is always a good example of that, uh, now mandate that data, regardless of what kind of data it is, needs to be published alongside the paper. Data security, in terms of storage of your sensitive data, as well as meeting funding and, as I said, paper publishing obligations. So major funders in, in Australia at this point are not mandating the publication of data, including sensitive data, um, although there is encouragement along that way. But what you may have found or might find is that collaborations, if you have collaborations with institutions overseas, particularly in the US and the UK, major funders there like the Wellcome Trust or NIH uh, do mandate publication of data, including some forms of sensitive data. And of course, there are benefits for wider science in terms of scientific rigour. So any forms of data that can be published can of course be checked um, by others, the values of open access. I think particularly for sensitive data, which might not apply to other forms of data, is that the kinds of data that, that we include in this category of sensitive data are often those that are most expensive and time consuming to collect and most taxing on participants. If that data can be published and potentially reused, then there's big points for, the, uh, for efficiency of research along those lines. So how, the guide, how did the guide take shape? What did we do? Well, we noticed that there's an absence of sensitive data records in repositories, including our own in Research Data Australia. And these are for the reasons that I, that I mentioned in an earlier slide. So we had some discussion and community food feedback around this, a review of the literature that was out there, and much consultation with and editing with experts um, in legal and ethical fields, as well as uh, experts in 
people that were experts in particular forms of sensitive data, such as ecological data. What we opted for was to focus on the user friendliness of the guide, so a user focused guide that included major decisions and the steps to publication in a clear, easy to follow way. And this is based around a flow diagram or a decision tree, which I'll get to very shortly. The focus or the key features of the sensitive data guide is to Firstly, to clearly outline the sequential steps involved in publishing and sharing sensitive data specifically, although the steps to publishing and sharing any forms of, of data um, are relevant in this. So if you're not dealing with sensitive data, you might still find uh, the processes or the steps outlined in the guide quite useful. To provide a decision framework for going through these steps. So if I've got this kind of data, what do I do next? Um, what's the appropriate sequence through each of those steps? You can tick them off as you go along encompassing definitions and some methodology for each steps. So it's quite hard to write an all-encompassing or an inclusive definition of sensitive data because many kinds of data will fit into that category and I'll, I'll go through some of those shortly. So keeping that in mind, in writing definitions or describing, for example, what sensitive data is, um, was to keep it relatively inclusive so that the focus is on encouraging the reader to think about what it is that might make their, their data sensitive from a legal and ethical point of view. And lastly, legal and ethical expertise to provide advice throughout uh, and before the release, as did sensitive data managers in, in some fields, which I mentioned. So in terms of thinking about, I mean, ANS, ANS is obviously involved in and we've given um, many webinars on various aspects of data management. So just to provide a bit of context, the guide is largely is focused largely on the publication and sharing part of that cycle. It is, of course, predicated by good data management. So your data has to be um, in good form before you consider, can consider publishing it, of course. And then the point of doing it is obviously to uh, reap the benefits of that, so data citation collaboration, potentially future funding. The guide's not intended to replace or override any institutional policies that, that you've come across. Um, so, for example, you might have within your institution uh, quite specific policies regarding um, data treatment or the confidentializing of data or how it's stored, what repositories to use, um, and intellectual property policies can vary a bit between institutions as well. It's intended to be a guide rather than a technical manual. So the focus, as I mentioned before, is is really on looking at the overview or the, the process of publishing data rather than detailed instructions on each of the processes along the way. There is some information there, but that's not to say that um, there will and there should be scenarios where you'll need greater detail or quite specific methods required for some kinds of sensitive data. Um, and we aim to keep updating um, a bibliography of, of where perhaps some more specific instructions can be found for each of those steps which will fit within the guide. And of course, there's more to come. So the sensitive data, data guide is iterative in its content. We'd like to keep updating it and adding more following feedback from the community, following feedback from you. To, we're looking at in 2015 to provide perhaps some more comprehensive modules or add-ons on specific aspects of sensitive data. And some that have come up already in feedback from releasing the guide are along the lines of um, perhaps ecological data specifically, da linked data and cultural data. So I look forward to more discussions about these with yourselves. And also there'll be plenty of opportunities for input along the way. Topics covered in the guide. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these in detail because we simply won't have time, but just to pique your interest and in case you're thinking, well, what's in there? Should I actually go and read further? These are the main topics that are in there. Defining what sensitive data is, confidentialising sensitive data, ethical considerations and legal matters, and licensing the data. I'll talk a little bit more about those today. Making data discoverable via a data repository, and what to publish and share, or in what conditions to publish and share the data. The guide includes some definitions where institutional policies may come in and might differ, so they point you to go and look for those within your own institution. Extra information that might help you in making your decisions and includes guidance not only for new data, but also if you're managing or you have um, existing data or data and whether the data is owned by you or, or owned by others. Key messages that have come out of the guide. 
probably beat you across the head with this a couple of times more before the end of the presentation, is that you can publish a description of your data, that is the meta metadata, without making the sensitive data itself openly accessible. Uh, you might have heard this before in terms of the public-private contrast, so making metadata public, but the data itself private or inaccessible under some conditions. You can place conditions around access to the data. Publishing your data or just a description of your data means that others can discover it and cite it. So that should be, or probably will be, um, the thing that you're most interested in, getting it out there. Sensitive data that has been confidentialised, so has been modified in a way that it is no longer sensitive, may be shared in, some, in many circumstances. And lastly, be a scout, plan ahead. So there are things that you can do when you're, before you collect your data or when you're collecting your data to make the process of publishing and sharing the sensitive data a lot easier in the long run. So the guide is based around the, as I mentioned, this idea of, well, how do we go from having the data to publishing the data? What are the steps involved and how do I make the decision about what those steps are and in what sequence to do them? So for example, I work in an area of uh, epidemiology. So I'm quite often using other people's data. So I would say, yes, I have sensitive data. And then I would follow along to, am I collecting new data? Mm -hmm. I've already got the data, is the data mine or is it somebody else's, so is it collected by you? So as you can see that the idea is to be able to quickly tick off boxes and work through each of those steps until you get to your desired endpoint. So to begin with, I thought we'd start with, well, the first step in that box, and probably the reason why many of you are here, is well, why, is, sorry, is my data sensitive or are my data sensitive? And this is the definition that we've got. Um, in the guide. So it might look familiar if you've already read that. Sensitive data are data that can be used to identify an individual, species, object or location that introduces a risk of, harm, risk of discrimination, harm or unwanted attention. Under law and the research ethics governance of most institutions, sensitive data of this form cannot typically be shared in this form with few exceptions. So it's actually very difficult to define uh, sensitive data inclusively, which many of you in the field would know, even though this is the very starting point to our, to our guide and to the process. And this is because what's out there at the moment, can the definitions can be quite disparate and they're typically discipline or sometimes institutionally specific. But what we wanted to do was to define sensitive data in a way that went back to the core principles of what it is. So the first being, it includes data which identifies a person or a thing or perhaps sometimes even um, an event or activity, and that this identification may introduce a potential risk of discrimination or harm. So in being inclusive and in, in being somewhat broad, it encourages uh, the reader of the guide to think about what and whether their data are sensitive. Sensitive data, as you would know, crosses many disciplines of research. Generally, it's um, separated into two main categories. The first being human data. This is probably what most people think of when they think of sensitive data. So this includes, um, and this is this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, human, sorry, health data. So medical records, um, data from clinical trials, epidemiological records from areas of social science. So social science is obviously research or data looking at the relationships between individuals and any aspect of society really. So common fields, um, political science, um, sociology, psychology, and also some fields of humanity. Um, and a common example of sensitive, uh, sorry, of social science data, um, which may be sensitive, is from surveys such as the census and also cultural, uh, cultural data. So for example, uh, research projects which collect information on um, sacred practices, events, locations and other information such as that. The other main category is ecological data. So a common example of that might be data about the locational practices um, surrounding vulnerable um, animal and plant species. Geospatial data, which is now collected um, alongside human and ecological data quite routinely, can lead to the data being sensitive because it can pinpoint the identity of, of who or where somebody is. Also sensitive data crosses it includes data that's quantitative, so it's in spreadsheets, numbers, qualitative, as well as, of course, geospatial data. So pretty much any form of data, if it includes identifying information and information which can potentially put a person or an object at risk of harm and discrimination, fits into this, into this category. How can sensitive data be published? Now, 
as I said, I won't go through the entire guide, but I thought the two areas that you're probably most interested in um, and that tend to be most controversial is, well, from a legal point of view and from an ethical point of view. So legally, when we talk about sensitive data, the, the legal acts that are triggered around sensitive data um, are foremostly the Privacy Act. So Privacy Act states that data that contains identifiers, so identifying information, um, people, and personal information. And you can have a look for more detail in Table 1 of the guide. So for example, personal information might be around cultural practices, it might be around criminal records and things like that. This kind of data triggers the Act. So these data cannot generally be shared in the original form. If people are no longer identifiable, so if the identifying information um, and relevant personal information, if it can be can ident lead to identification is removed, then technically the Act is no longer triggered. But of course, this must the this must must meet definitions of identifiability and confidentiality of that Act, and we go through that in quite a lot um, of detail in the guide um, because it is a point that that people are concerned about quite rightly um, and we we're very pleased to have um, an expert in this field review that section um, and he'll be speaking in the next webinar. And also uh, the re other relevant sections are our chapter on confidentialising data which you might be interested to read too. Also from a legal point of view to think about is licensing data, any kind of data but including um, sensitive or confidentialised data before it's published. In Australia all data should have a licence. It explains how the data can be used and attributed. And without a licence, it, it will be unclear um, to the reuser, reuser how the data can be reused, and this might discourage reuse as well. Some repositories do have their own licences, um, but also anybody is, um, is able to use the set of, the suite of endorsed licences at OSCOL, and there's some links there if you'd like to go and have a look at those. And I strongly encourage you to, because it's very user-friendly. How can sensitive data be published from an ethical point of view? Again, this is what is written in the guide, and I think it's a really important part to start from. So I'll just read out this, the, um, the introduction to that section. So in addition to meeting legal standards, researchers have ethical obligation towards participants and research subjects. These include preserving privacy and avoiding any possible harm arising from participation in research and its subsequent publication. The ethical management, management of data must be the primary concern of researchers to maintain participants' trust and research integrity. So of course it was one of our primary concerns in writing the guide is um, how to look at publishing sensitive data from an ethical point of view. In, and that of course includes in how a researcher or a data management um, operates within the ethical applications um, and committees within their institution. So the key message to publishing sensitive data in an ethical manner is to plan ahead. So include plans to publish confidentialized sensitive data, so this is sensitive data which has had identifying information and information which would place an individual at, at risk of identification and potential harm has been removed. And again, please um, have a look at the, the inf more detailed information about confidentialising within the guide in your ethics applications, so before the data is even collected if you can, um, and also to include in any information to participants and in consent forms from human participants as well. We've got some uh, great examples from other from other places that are being used around the world about how to include information about the publication of uh, human data when asking in asking permission in consent forms of participants um, in the research study. That's really handy. The story is, of course, a bit more complex for existing data where specific consent for publication wasn't asked of participants. So we're largely talking about human participants here. Um, but there is some, that can still often be done in some situations and we've got some very clear steps as to when and how that can be done in the guide. So check out section 4.2 for that. So what are, what are your options in terms of publishing sensitive data? How do you get it out there um, in a legal and an ethical way um, so that you can reap the benefits or perhaps meet the funding obligations um, involved in your research? So you can place conditions around access to the confidentialised sensitive data, and this would be the recommended action for the vast majority of cases of sensitive data publication. I keep saying sensitive data publication, but as you would have picked up from now, picked up earlier, what I'm, I'm talking about when I say that is, is sensitive data that has been confidentialised already. Obviously, um, data that's got 
people's names, addresses, or specifically identify or other forms of identifying information is not data that you can legally put out there um, unless it's been modified and ethically you shouldn't be put out there unless it's been modified. So we're talking about data that's been treated in some way so that it no longer places um, the participants at risk. So if you place conditions around access to the data, this is what we would call conditional access. So this is where the metadata, so a description of your project and of your data set is available to the public, but access to the data itself only, only occurs after predetermined conditions are met. So common conditions, um, this is already uh, happening in quite a number of fields, and we'll go through a great example of that um, shortly with the Australian Longitudinal Study of Women's Health. But conditions that can be placed around access to sensitive data, common ones are providing information about who and how the uh, reuser wants to use, store or manage the data. Um, they would usually have to agree to conditions of data security and register or provide contact details. In some cases, um, also agree that they may be contacted um, by the original data owners for purposes of collaboration or for other reasons as well. And you can set the conditions around access. Majority of repositories will allow you to do that. This isn't, um, you won't be able to read the detail, but this is just a, um, a screenshot from a um, from the Australian Data Archive, which deals um, largely in social science data. Uh, and this is actually the record for the Australian Longitudinal Study of Women's Health. But it shows a metadata description of the data set, but to actually receive access to get the, the data itself, and you can just see where that, the one and the two, Little highlighted sections are there. This directs the, um, the potential reuser or the reader of this metadata record as to how they would do that. So this is the best way to do it. Click on that and it will tell you under what conditions um, and how you can gain access to the data itself and what you would need in to, to what conditions you need to meet um, to do that and how to do that. I'm going to move over now to Associate Professor Lee Tu, who we're very lucky to have with us today. Uh, Lee is the Deputy Director of the Australian Longitudinal Study of Women's Health, um, and she's also the Chair of the Publications Sub Substudies and Analysis Committee, which is the committee that deals with um, applications to reuse this particular data set. Lee's going to talk about how they, how their sensitive data um, is confidentialised so that it can be reused, how they have public metadata or descriptions of the data set, but with conditions around the access to that. And what the benefits of publication of publishing and sharing um, this study are. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sarah, and um, good afternoon, everybody. And I'd like to um, um, thank Sarah for inviting me to give an overview of our study and exactly how uh, we have you know, go about sharing some of the very sensitive and personal data that our women have provided us. So, just to start with. Just this um, quote from our study director, Professor Geeta Mishra, just illustrating that how fundamental data sharing is to study and that it very much is a public resource funded by the government and available to all people who want to use it, providing they follow certain conditions. So that's just a really nice sort of overview to start. So just for those of you who are not aware, the Longitudinal Study is a collaborative project of the University of Newcastle and Queensland. And it's been going since 1995, so it's one of the longest running longitudinal studies in Australia. And we were lucky to be able to recruit over 40,000 Australian women aged aged between 18 and 75 back in 1996 and we've recently added another 17,000 women, young women to our study last year. So just to give you an overview of exactly who our women are, we've got three aged cohorts in the original sample who were recruited in 1995 and 6. So we have women born between 1921 and 26 who, when they joined the study, were aged 70 to 75. Then we have a cohort of women born between 1946 and 51, who were then aged 45 to 50. And we had a group of women born between 1973 and 78, who were then aged 18 to 23. And you can see now that, 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 that these women um, 
have aged. Our oldest women are now entering their late 80s and early 90s. Our mids are now in their mid 60s, and our and our then young women are now in their late 30s and early 40s. So, after the 2010 National Women's Health Policy and discussions we had with the government, um, the government agreed to fund us to recruit a new group of young women because we argued we were no longer able to represent or provide data about young women in Australia today because our young cohort was ageing. So we were very fortunate enough to be able to recruit another 17,000 last year um, to, to become our new young cohort of women. So that's who's in the study. Basically what we have done with the original cohorts is we have surveyed them approximately three yearly since 1996. So we have a wealth of information about them and we are now up to our seventh survey of our young women which is currently underway as I speak um, and we've recently um, completed our seventh survey of our mid-aged women. With the new young cohort however because of the online technologies that are available today we, we actually survey them annually now and we collect a whole range of data on all aspects of women's life including mental, physical, reproductive and social aspects of their health, asking questions about life transitions, about life events, issues such as employment or caring, looking at health service use and so on. And the other advantage um, that, that we have recently been able to implement is data linkage with national and state based administrative data sets. And these include information about um, health service use through MBS, through pharmaceutical use through the PBS, data on incidence of cancer, on hospitalisations and also in, on um, perinatal information as well. And just to give you a bit of a feel, we have over 600 people who have used our data both nationally and internationally. So it's been a very, a very big data source with a lot of people who have used it. So what impact has the study had? Basically our data have been reported in over 500 papers in a, across a whole range of journals and we have had a significant impact in informing national health policies in all sorts of areas including chronic health conditions, physical activity, violence, nutrition, caring and so on. And possibly our most significant um, um, sort of output was towards the 2010 National Women's Health Policy where our data was cited extensively throughout the policy. Another way that we contribute is by adding value to other data sources, for example by the data linkage projects that I mentioned earlier. An example of that is a paper published um, through from one of our chief investigators in 2011 in the Medical Journal of Australia which was looking at women's use of mental health services and looked at the numbers of women across the country who were accessing mental health services by whether they actually reported having a mental health condition or not. And these, this information and these data were able to help the government in terms of its mental health policy provision. Another example is, is by the way that we can support sub-studies and also large data pooling research. An example of that is the Dynopter project. Some of you may have heard of this. This was called the Dynamic Analysis to Optimise Aging Project. And we were part of a pooled data set from nine other longitudinal studies in Australia that had included some aspect of aging. So turning back to now the topic of today's seminar, and this is how do we how do we actually manage the sensitive information that we collect? Because we ask very personal information, including questions about reproductive events, about sexual identity, about violence. And these are questions that are incredibly personal to people and we can't just go sharing that information. And our study is considered to be a public resource funded by the government and open to anybody who really wants to use our data. So how do we actually go about sharing these data legally and ethically?
So the next couple of slides I'll just talk about our processes. So basically when the women join the study and at every survey that they complete, they are informed and asked to consent that their survey data will be linked with their previous survey responses so that we can follow women longitudinally. And women have the choice to say, no, I do not want this to happen, in which case we can only use their data in a cross-sectional way, or women can withdraw from the study altogether. We also get women to sign a, a consent form and to read an information sheet where they agree and that openly says to them that we that your data will be used, but you will not be able to be personally identifiable from your data, that we will de-identify your data. So we've set that condition up front with anybody who's part of the study. And then in terms of how we manage the data practically, all the surveys that we receive are de-identified and confidential. So when a woman first joined the study, her personal identifying information was removed from the survey and in its place she was awarded what's called an ID alias, which is just an alias number. For example, 206069 is the ID alias of one of the women in our mid-age cohort. So the, the unique identifiers linking the ID alias to the personal identifying information of a particular woman is held securely at the University of Newcastle. And only the data manager at the University of Newcastle has access to these. So the rest of the staff, me included, at the University of Newcastle and the University of Queensland have no idea who the women are who were in our study. And so any data set that we send out for people to use for analysis, on that data set, the first column is the ID alias, so that they can then link that ID alias to future surveys with future data. But again, they have no idea who that woman is. And another level of protection that we offer is because we have women from all over Australia, including rural and remote areas, we have the geocoded data of those women's addresses. And some researchers who were doing research on geocoding and looking at, for example, women's response to drought um, and may want to know a postcode that a woman lives in, we have strict criteria that we do not release data that is smaller than a certain geographical area so that there is no way that anyone could work out um, that that ID alias that comes from that postcode could be a particular woman. So we have metadata available about the ALSWA um, in several national repositories including Research Data Australia, the Australian Data Archives and Trove. And this basically is just a description of the sort of data that we have. But if you want to access our data, you must come and ask us and get permission to do that. And so we have our, our, our own public website that is very, um, uh, it's very complex and has a, an awful lot of information in it, but we, but we have a specific section about how to access the data. So if you click on that link, then you have to come and put an application in and so basically you have to complete an expression of interest form. You have to provide information about, about yourself, about what you want to do with the data, your research question, the variables you want to ask, your analysis plan, and all the details about exactly what you want to do with the data. If you want to use the linked data, you have to provide a justification for why you need the linked data. And you have to provide information about what your publications what you're intending to do with the data, what publications you're planning, what conference presentations and so on. So this application is reviewed by the Publication Substudies and Analyses Committee, which consists of all of the steering committee members plus a couple of other experts. And this process takes a couple of months and the, each application is reviewed on merit to make sure that it's an appropriate use of the women's data and that it's feasible. And then if that is approved, then as a data reuser, you need to sign a statement of data use and also confidentiality statements. And anybody who uses our data must sign, this, must sign these statements. And these basically cover aspects of what you are going to do with the data and that you're not going to send the data on to somebody else who hasn't signed these documents and that you're going to treat the data properly. And also once you have signed these documents and received the data and you can begin your analyses, we ask you then to 
provide a six monthly progress report and update so that we can keep a rough idea that you're doing what you said you were going to do and not breaching any agreements that you may have had with us. Great, thank you very much, uh, Lee. Following on from Lee, just in summary, in, in discussing earlier what's included in the guide um, and then hearing a great, um, a great story about how sensitive data, which we often think about as something that's too difficult to share, uh, as something that where there are already and for a long time has been some great examples of data publication and sharing in a very large scale and in very uh, influential and successful ways. So sensitive data publication and sharing can be done. What you might like to go away today and, and think about, well, what, can, what could I do to start or what could I do right now? is to um, familiarise yourself with, with local policies um, for your institution on, on around intellectual property, um, licensing of data, um, if you have any um, recommended policies around the confidentialising of data, um, about what repositories to use. And if you're in the stage where you haven't already collected your data, take advantage of that and plan ahead ethics, in terms of ethics applications and consent forms, include information about potential data sharing um, for your participants and for your ethics committees before the data is collected. Um, and that will save you a lot of grief and make this process of publication and sharing and the, the potential benefits of that for you uh, much, much easier along the track. You can start by publishing your metadata if you've already got your data sensitive data set um, there and you're wondering, well, what can I do now? How can I start taking advantage um, of this data set now? You can publish a description of your data without making the data itself openly accessible. And as we've said a number of times, and this is the recommended way to go about um, publishing confidentialised sensitive data, because no one will know about your data if you don't publish a description of the data in the lease to begin with. And it's very rare to be unable to at least put a description, a good description of your data out there with further information about when or how it's already available, access to the data can be gained. If you put the uh, description of your data out there, it's nothing to stop you doing that and then from keep working on access around uh, maybe you need to um, treat your data in some way in terms of, of confidentialisation and you can include information about that obviously in the description of your project. But how you can keep working, you can keep working on access conditions if you require some further expertise, advice um, or time to do that. But getting a description of your data out there um, is something that can be done almost immediately. We really greatly um, value your feedback on this topic, particularly as I mentioned, it is an iterative process. So we're going to keep adding more detail and more references um, to the sensitive data section of the ANS website. And if you've got even content to share in terms of if your institution has um, has some guides or information around this topic, please send them either directly to me or our um, main contact page. We'd love to hear from you.